Hey, thanks for joining us today at Alive Online. This series is all about discovering what is at the core of Alive. We hope that this series impacts your life and that these teachings are valuable to you. If you have any questions throughout this time, you can reach out to us at AliveWestland.com or on any of our social media platforms. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's gotten small over the years. It says, uh, drink coffee and stack bodies. And so we thought that'd be negative as a pastor to kind of have that, but that's what it says on this side. Now just you people know, nobody else knows that. So, hey, glad you're here. Um, Glad that you're part of what's going on. I got two incredible announcements that I get the honor of being able to share with you. The first one is that we're actually launching an online campus uh, today. We're doing it just for the Alive community right now. And what we mean by that is we want you to log on and you to experience it and to see what it's like to give your feedback. So let me tell you a little bit what it means. So the whole service will be live, like you'll include include the music, the announcements, the bumper videos, messages, everything will be live. And then there'll be a, we have chaplains every time it airs that will be in the chat rooms to uh, help through pastoral issues, pray through things or things like that. So we know a lot of folks travel, a lot of experiences, like we're not able to be here every week. This is our chance to kind of give this a whirl, to give it a try. So if you're interested in that, let us know what you think. The second announcement I have that I'm really personally excited about is passages. For years, a couple years now, um, Matt has given me the privilege of hosting, or Lisa and I the privilege of hosting a, a guy's small group in our home on Sunday evenings, and so they show up in droves, and their pickup trucks are parked everywhere, uh, across the front pasture, all kinds of places, they're everywhere. And, um, and so that's an exciting thing. And watching these young men develop uh, kind of birthed in me this desire uh, to do a passages retreat. And what I mean by that is, as I work with my son, who is a junior in high school, um, I teach him certain lessons to moving from boyhood to manhood and what that looks like. And so Passages Retreat is designed to help fathers and teenage sons work through those five passages together. And so we're gonna try it this year. It's March 20th and 21st. Um, I, here's what I want to tell you, so don't get mad at me. This will fill up. There's only so many spots, and so we're not able to get more because of the retreat center kind of things and limitations. The other thing I want to say is this. Some of you uh, have teenage sons, but no dad in the picture. And so um, here's what we're doing. We have, I've recruited some individuals who will help your son go through this passages retreat with them. So even if you don't have that opportunity that you're, you know, the dad's not in the picture or whatever, you can still sign your kid up and we'll make sure they get home. Uh, I mean, mean, we'll make sure something great happens in their lives and they get home, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, that's also going on. You can sign up online for those things as well. Um, I'd love for you to be a part of that. One other thing, uh, we're doing that, as Matt mentioned, that like go back to 205 after this service. My wife, Lisa, will be in the lobby giving you the finger um, to send you back to that room. I don't, I'm not sure what you carnal people were thinking. Um, We're talking about my wife here, okay? I mean, but it's a red foam finger. I didn't know she was gonna do this. She just told me between services, she's gonna do that. So at least give her a high five or something on the way out. So she'll think, wow, they're so friendly today. (laughs) Okay. You know what? I'm going to give you the finger. Anyway, so let's pray. No, 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 let, let's, let's try to get back on track. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and your love. Thank you for these beautiful, beautiful people. And Lord, um, I believe we're all here for a reason. Uh, we didn't come here just because we had nothing else to do. But you somehow cleared calendars, cleared schedules, maybe made an attraction to a boy or a girl. But for some reason, we're here today. And so as long as we're here, Lord, we want to hear what you have to say. So have your way, uh, we ask, in a, in a powerful way today. We just want to be more like you when we leave, uh, how we see ourselves, how we see people, how we love people. We want to be a little bit more like you. Lord, our, our hearts are especially burdened today with the coronavirus and all that's happening um, in China. And we want to ask you to have mercy, Lord. Um, have mercy on what's going on there. And I pray that you would, you, would, you would just stop it. You have that power and just cease it, I pray. In your name we ask. Amen. So uh, this is the last installment in this series, which is the Chewy Chocolate Center of Alive, was kind of what we're going after. And if you missed any of those, you know, you're absolutely free to go online and check those out. Um, if you were cut alive open, the napkin drawing that we've been sharing with you over the last few weeks is kind of what you would see, and that's basically this. The napkin drawing says, we want to reach spiritually hungry people, and we want to see two things happen in their lives. This is our agenda for you, for your family, uh, and the agenda for me. It's that we want to see people begin a personal relationship with Jesus, personal 
relationship with Jesus. So it's not something that you just come and hear Tom talk about on Sundays, but it's actually something you're engaged with weekly and and daily uh, in your personal lives. And then an active role in healthy Christian community. Here's why these are two big deals for us. The conviction is, if anybody will do this, any marriage couple, any single person, any old person, young person, or in-between person, whatever you are, if you'll engage in that, you'll experience spiritual transformation. That's the conviction of our church. This will change your life. This will change your family. This will change who you are. And so we push those things all the time, and, and that's not a perfect organization, but hopefully if you hang around alive for a while, you'll understand Everything we do points back to this basic napkin, napkin drawing. Now, that sounds really good, and it is really good. But today, what I want to go after in this last installment is basically talking about a potential problem in church world. So let's think of church world today kind of as this um, baseball diamond. Let me focus, because I'm just used to circles. So, so, so it's kind of like a kite, but it's okay. I mean, you, you get the idea. And so um, let's just think of baseball diamond, and let's just say this is first base. Well, what we mean by first base is we want people to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so our goal, our hope, is that somehow everyone that's listening to the sound of my voice will eventually decide to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, and that's going to change your life. And then the second base, if you will, let's just call that the active role in healthy Christian community. And this one, of course, is a female, uh, and now they have arms. And so these, these, this is healthy Christian community, and this is what church world is all about. So we want people to get saved and find healthy Christian community. Here's the danger that I see in church world. You, you see. The danger I have and see in church world is we start piling people up on second base and we count it a win. So in other words, they begin a personal relationship with Jesus. These folks are in a country line dance, but uh, there's kind of, <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening with there. So I, I don't even know how to fix it without, I'll, I'll draw something I shouldn't. So I mean, whatever that is, that, that's just fix that. So that's what we basically do is we're piling people up on second base. And, and that's what I mean. That we get people and they come and they find Jesus and they get involved in a small group and they start doing potlucks on Sunday night or whatever they do. And then that's it. And, and it's like, that seems to be all there is. So we're getting people saved and they're starting to be discipled in their small group and find friends to do like life with. But that's it. You know, churches are pretty good at that. And we leave people on second base. Here's the thing. I'm not sure this is spiritual transformation and what it's intended to do. I'm not sure that our agenda with each other should be, let's get them on the Jesus bus and then get them doing Christian life with other Christians who are on the Jesus bus until we all die. Then we can have a Christian funeral. Not to mention that's rather dark and depressing what I just said, but who wants that kind of life? Is this all about making sure I'm good to go and then I show up every week for a little pep talk that keeps me engaged? Is that what this whole Christianity, you know, is about? Let me, let me, let's say you're with me and, and you've seen these things happen in your life or maybe you've wondered, maybe you left the church because this got so dull and boring and, and I get that. What if there's a, what if there's a, a next step? What if there's something beyond this? What if there's something beyond all of us getting together and looking and smelling like Christians and then talking about how the world's going to hell? What if there's something more than that? Because I think that's what church is sort of missing. And the answer to that question is actually part of the chewy chocolate center of alive that you have to understand. Organizations uh, for the last t- probably two decades have been encouraged to form mission statements and, and they take the mission statements and they put them on the walls of their restaurants or their gyms or their uh, corporations and put it on their letterhead and all that kind of stuff. And mission statements and churches have these, it's basically this, they answer the question, what is your why? What is your why? Now if the why of a life is just that, I've got another question. Why am I spending my life doing that? I mean, who wants to do just that? Is is that the goal? 
So over the years, I've consulted with a lot of churches who've come and they say, hey, Tom, why don't you talk about, it? I want to talk about our mission statement and kind of run it by you and see what you think about all that kind of stuff. And so we have these conversations and they'll want us, you know, is this a good mission statement, you know, and can we borrow a lives mission statement, all that kind of stuff, it's just great. But in these discussions, I usually end up reminding the people who are asking these church leaders with this, you know, Jesus has really already given us the why. That hasn't changed. So Release the pressure there, brother, because you don't have to invent this. What you're trying to do is take Jesus' why and make it at a point where your people can actually get the context of it and grab hold of it. Today, what I want to do is I want to show you a story. It's actually really happened, but I want to, the way it's described. In this, in this story, Jesus boldly, unequivocally shares his Why? And so the story starts in uh, about when Jesus is entering a town called Jericho. He's passing through Jericho. Everybody gets wind of that. And so there's this huge parade. Jesus is passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. Christian commercial. How many of you grew up knowing the song Zacchaeus was a wee little man? Come on, can I see your hands? We're not going to sing it. Just relax. But I have this thought that Zacchaeus gets to heaven and he's waiting because he hears there's this song written about him on earth. And it calls him a wee little man for eternity. And so we're all going to get to heaven. Can you imagine this? For thousands of years. And you all get to heaven. You're like, oh, Zacchaeus, you're the wee little man. And so then I picture the guy who wrote the song getting to heaven. Think, oh, I made it. And Zacchaeus coming up. You know, hitting him right in the kneecap or, or somewhere to kind of like, that that's probably doesn't happen in heaven, but wouldn't that be funny if it did? That'd be, but I digress. So Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a sellout. And what I mean by that is um, tax collectors were Jewish people who the Romans hired to collect taxes from Jewish people. You with me? And so um, the Romans would say to these guys, hey, listen, we want this much money. Anything you can collect above that you get to keep. And so Jewish tax collectors were known cheats in the town because they would take what the Romans wanted and then they would charge you like 20% more and you still had to pay because they had Roman authority over them. And on top of this, Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. So that means he's overseeing a whole bunch of other tax collectors who are doing the exact same thing. One of the most despised men in the region. Zacchaeus chief tax collector, and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, verse 3, but being a short man, which there it is again, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead, he climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now here's my question. Why? Why would Zacchaeus want to see Jesus? That rhymed. You're welcome. You want me to write a rap for you in that moment? No, you do not. But anyway, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus wearing Jesus. Anyway, okay, no, no, just stop, stop, stop. Yeah, I know, don't moan. Why? Why did he want to see Jesus? Isn't that weird? I mean, this man was wealthy. And he was aware that he was cheating people in the town. He had more money than he knew what to do with and more money coming in. He was also aware that religious people would not approve of him coming to see Jesus. He was ostracized by people. He didn't even go to Walmart because he didn't want to run into these people in town. And yet he goes. Why? I, I would suggest, I think, I think Zacchaeus was tired Being lost is exhausting. Y'all remember? Uh, Perhaps Zacchaeus' guilt and shame kept him from sleeping at night. I've had a few of those nights, haven't you? I mean, you sit there and you you kind of flip back and forth. You think about someone you hurt or think about something you did and you just feel horrible. And I I bet Zacchaeus is actually self-medicating some. He's either trying to keep very busy so he doesn't have to deal with who he really is or he's trying to medicate with abusing alcohol or something else at night so he can go to sleep. Because even Zacchaeus didn't want to be Zacchaeus. He wasn't fooling himself. I mean, he knew who he was and what he did. 
Zacchaeus liked what he had. He just didn't like who he had become to have what he had. Nobody likes to be ostracized. Nobody likes to be hated all the time. And Zacchaeus was alone and unloved, and he knew it. And how do you know this, Tom? Well, I've been there and read that book. Haven't you? Because it's exactly what some of us have felt or some of us are even feeling now. It's just exhausting being lost. No purpose, no understanding, no worldview that makes sense. And this is why we get Zacchaeus and probably even feel a little sorry for him. We know when, we know when we're messed up or when we're filled with shame-producing shame event or regret over our sin. We all know that. Nobody has to tell us these things. And, and being lost is this juggling act where we try to figure out a new way to deal with shame or regrets or guilt. We try to remember who we were at this place because we're not going to be the same person we were at this place. And it's this juggling of not being a person of integrity. One person in public and we fool a lot of people. But it's exhausting because you cannot fool the person you're looking at the mirror every night when you end your day. Zacchaeus functioned in exhaustion because being lost is exhausting. Lacking integrity is exhausting. You know what else I find really interesting at this point in the story, though? Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus because people were in the way. Now, that's a literal, literal thing, but I think it's also a figurative one. Because there's no doubt there were a good many people standing on second base in Jericho. That's why everybody wanted to see the parade. Oh, Jesus is coming. We all believe in him. Let's all get together. All kinds of small groups said, hey, let's go see Jesus together. We can have our potluck afterwards. And all these people started gathering, all kinds of people doing life together. All kinds of people went to synagogue and sang the songs and tried to live moral lives. But we don't read anything about any believers in Jericho who were thinking, man, wouldn't it be great if Zacchaeus could see Jesus? More likely, if Tom were there, as the people saw Zacchaeus at the gathering, their thoughts would be, what in the world is he doing here? He didn't belong here. Or, or maybe, maybe their thoughts were, I'm on base, and that's all that matters. You see, often the biggest barrier to lost people finding Jesus is people who follow Jesus. And that's exactly what's happening in Zacchaeus' story. You see, it's crowded on second base. And we like the base we're on, and so we can get stingy, and churches can get stingy, and often churches will adopt an unstated philosophy. Keep the outsiders out and the insiders in. Make no adjustments for lost people. If they want Jesus, they can worship and find him according to my tastes and my preferences, just like I did. And man, this philosophy from the second base is crippling churches. It's causing us to die on the vine. Not only just die by numbers, we're dying spiritually. And there seems to be two nuances to the idea of second base people making these decisions. Not only do I see them in the church, but to be totally vulnerable, I see them in my own life. One nuance is people who claim to follow Jesus they stand on this second base, but we're standing there in judgment and self-righteousness. We'll, we'll, throw, we'll throw a judgment on a whole group of people. We'll just throw them all into one bus and send them straight to hell and not even think twice about it. Ah, those people suck. We're just going to just go. It's a second base cheer. They become so focused on the sin they can't stand on someone else. Someone who doesn't believe that they can't see the sin of themselves, those who do believe, who do stand on second base. The, the other nuance of this philosophy for second base people is we start making a list of who belongs on base and who doesn't. 
Ah, oh, well, if you're really saved, you'll vote this way. If you're really saved, you won't do this, but you will do this. You'll wear this, but you won't wear that. You'll drive this, but you won't drive that. And it gets dangerous. It gets destructive. And I've not only seen that in the church, I've seen that in my own life. I'd never let you see it, but I've seen it in my life. The nuance is people claim to follow Jesus, stand on second base in judgment. And the other nuance is people make a list about who's in, and it's dangerous. There's a prophetic word for people that make lists. It's actually several. This one's just from Isaiah 29. I picked it out to share with you. It says this. So the Lord says, these people say they're mine. We're second base runners. We're on base. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Look at that. Oh, you say the right thing, but your heart's not following your words. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. Listen, I don't know how you think you got to second base here, (laughs) but rules are powerless to change a human heart. They will not. And you may got your life and lifestyle set up where you're following a certain rule or what you grew up in so your home looks more like mom and dad's or grandma and grandpa's. But make no, no mistake, rules are powerless to change a human heart. Only a relationship can change the heart. Rules don't redeem anything. Only Jesus can. So Zacchaeus is in this sycamore tree. Jesus comes by. Here's where we pick up the story. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Two surprises for me here. The first one is, how did Jesus know his name? I mean, couldn't Facebook stalk him? Because Jesus would never be on Facebook. How did he know his name? I don't know how he knew the name. But I can tell you this. I kind of like the idea of a Jesus who knows my name even when I won't bow to his. You know? Even when I'm up acting a fool, Jesus comes by. Hey, Tom. And then... Jesus expresses a need. The actual translation of that little word must is, it is absolutely necessary. It is absolutely necessary, Zacchaeus. I stay at your house today. Jewish culture, when you shared a meal with someone, it was a sign to the whole community that you're associated with them. Now this encourages me Jesus knew his name, so if he knew his name, can't we also assume he knew everything associated with Zacchaeus' name? He knew where he hung out. He knew what he drank and when he drank too much. He knew who he was sleeping with. He knew what he was watching late at night when no one else was up. He knew his browser history. See, it's safe to say that Jesus knew what everybody else knew about Zacchaeus and then some. And Jesus says, it is absolutely necessary I go to your house today, Zacchaeus. This will upset the second base runners in the story. This is going to make them flip. People standing on second base. People that have experienced a personal relationship with Jesus and now find themselves growing in that faith. Verse 7 reads, the second base runners, that's a loose translation, but the people were actually displeased. He's gone, the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Hey, Jesus, while you're in that really nice house up there and eating that great food, Look out the window and see my poor house with barely enough food to feed my kids because of that man's selfishness and greed.
But this is one of those moments where you see the real mastery of Jesus' teaching. Because not only is Jesus going to do something for Zacchaeus, but he's exposing an, the ugly underbelly of people standing on second base. Respectfully, of the church people. We think the story is all about Zacchaeus, and in many ways it will be, but the story is also about the base runners, those who claim to believe, because Zacchaeus' sin was very public. Everybody knew it, but the people standing on second base, it's hard to see some of the private sins of your judgmental attitude and your self-righteousness. But in this story, Jesus is exposing the private sin of those people who say they follow him. Those people who are running the bases. He's exposing that the people say they love Jesus and are following Jesus and his message of love hate people. And they become self-righteous and judgmental toward people. And Jesus is exposing that. Now, now contrast that. Look at the change in Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. What a contrast. The base runners wanted to run the guy out of town. And they're getting mad at Jesus for not wanting to do what they wanted to do. Zacchaeus hears Jesus come to his house, and he's pumped. The sinner has joy in the presence of Jesus, and the self-righteous people are grumbling in the presence of Jesus and drafting an email. The sinner is offering whatever he has to honor Jesus. And the self-righteous are criticizing and looking at the possibilities of what might be wrong if Jesus goes to his house. Look what happens to Zacchaeus, verse eight. Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Just to pause. Really, Zacchaeus? Really? (laughs) If? I mean, have you ever done that? (laughs) Lord, if I've done anything to displease you, I can think of 10. Maybe you don't know about them. But if I've done anything, that's kind of what's going on here. But you know what else is going on here? When a dude says, look, I'll give them back four times as much. Anybody I've cheated on their taxes, you know what's going on? This is called repentance. It's where you rethink how you think about everything. And when people meet Jesus, this happens You rethink how you think about everything. And Zacchaeus begins his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he starts running the bases, if you will. In fact, Jesus says, salvation has come to this home today. And that's something. (laughs) The wee little man is now the free little man. Second verse, little known verse, I should write it. You know what? If I'm in the crowd that day and I hear that announcement, oh, he's going to pay four times back, whatever. You know what I, you know what I think? Wouldn't be, and I'm, I'm here, so I wouldn't think, oh, this is going to be awesome. Way to go, Zacchaeus. Come on, let me make a spot. You know what I think? I believe when I see it. In fact, I'd say, Jesus... Let's wait till the check clears before we actually put that verse in print. Let's see if this thing's going to stick. Not, not Jesus' perspective. Jesus' perspective to the people on second base is to stop counting them out and start counting them in. Jesus is saying, stop, stop excluding him and start including him. And you say, why should we do that? And now you're ready to hear the mission of Jesus. Now you're ready to hear Jesus' why. And he says it succinctly in his next words. This is what Jesus says. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. 
Sometimes we get on the bases and we lose track of Jesus' why. And you know what happens when churches lose track of Jesus' why? We start beating the fool out of each other. We'll start complaining about what that small group did or what that pastor said or what that worship sounded like or how those people are voting, right? You've seen this. Come on, don't leave me alone up here. That's what we do. It's ugly. It's ugly, man. It's ugly. Other places, Jesus would say, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, teaching. In Luke 15, he tells three stories. He tells a story about a a widow who loses a coin And he tells a story about a lamb that gets lost. And then he tells a story about a son who gets lost. And all of the three items are found in Luke 15. Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus desires those who believe to advance his kingdom. Make no mistake. I've got pushed back on this for years. And it's always from second base runners who will tell me, Tom, discipleship is an important piece. Granted, it is, but it wasn't Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. We'll get them discipled, but Jesus' mission was to seek and save the lost. I'm concerned that it's no longer the mission of the church. So, Jesus brings those who believe, base runners. He says, you're on base for a purpose, and that is to advance the kingdom, to advance my mission, to join me in this mission, to enlist in bringing the Zacchaeuses and the Toms of this world to a personal relationship with Jesus and an active role in healthy Christian community. That's why our church has worked hard over the last few years to do this thing we're calling the four Ds. I want you to understand the Chewy Chocolate Center behind those four Ds. You see, everything on this side has me at the center. Of course I want a personal relationship with Jesus. If that means I avoid hell, that's a great idea. Oh, if I can find a small group that I like, people that I like doing life with, that'll be great for me and for my children. But this isn't the mission. So in our church, we call this first area discovery. Many of you have been through that. That's a membership thing. And then over here, that's where we tell you what a lives about and the basic gospel message. And then second base, you know, right here, this is where we do deepen. And deepen is where you learn how to pray, you learn how to read scripture for yourself, you learn how to honor God with, with every part of who you are. But then there's this piece over here on third base, and we call this the define. And where define is where you learn the spiritual gifts that God gave you. According to scripture, every one of us received spiritual gifts. You might be aware of them, you may not, I don't know. But you have been given a gift by God. You say, Tom, I would never want to be on the platform speaking. And I say, I get get that. And you say, but I don't mind like showing up early to make sure the thing's ready to go for people to arrive. Great. Tom, I'd never want to be with the kids because I don't even like kids. You probably shouldn't be in there then. That's a fair fair thing. Would you... (laughs) But maybe, maybe what you'd like to do is be a greeter or maybe you'd like to take the offering or maybe serve in the band. I don't know. Maybe the tech crew. I don't know. You know, we got volunteers that show up every week. Uh, well, not this time of year. But all the grounds are done by volunteers. People say, I don't know if I really want to do anything like up in public or whatever, but I, I sure could show up and give you a couple hours to mow. My point for that is whatever that is, the Chewy Chocolate Center of the church is God has given you a gift to do something. And that something will be you throwing your gift into the ring to seek and save the lost people. And then the last part of this four Ds is where you decide, you sit down with people in the church, consultant, and you say, hey, um, I think this is where I want to try to serve. And you get in there, you don't like it, you know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> go, go serve somewhere else. But the point is, get your rear end off second base. It's, 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 
You don't score by getting on second base. It's good for the stats, but it doesn't help us win the game. I think God asks all of us to be part of the mission. To seek actually means to move, to actively search with effort, not sit in a building and cruise your way on second, second base. The, the word save, this is a great word. Someday I should do a whole thing on this, but the word save means someone has gotten to the edge of something very dangerous. And to save them literally means to pull them back from the edge of danger. That's apparently what we're supposed to be involved in. <sighs> but why? What possible motivation could I offer you, a very busy group of people, to take the next step in this area? Because you're mostly on second base. You're good to go. What would be the motivation for you to even give a rat's fanny about what comes next? I had a change of heart on this a number of years ago because I didn't want to do it because somebody said I should. I wanted to know why I should. You know what the difference was in my life? I stopped trying to forget my sin. I know that sounds really weird, and I'm not even sure I can sell it to you. I stopped trying to forget that there was a time I was a real jerk an unsaved jerk. And I did things that I am not proud of in those days. You wouldn't be proud of me either. See, I spent my whole life when I got saved, I started hanging out with second base people and I looked around at second base people and they all looked so good. I'm like, dang, I'm probably the only person in the room who ever had that thought. So I started acting and pretending like I didn't have that thought either. And they loved me for that. Tom, you've never done, no, 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 never even thought about it, never even have considered that till you mentioned it. Those people do, though. And then the very reason I got into Christianity, which was a heart that was living a lie, I developed standing on second base, a heart that was living a lie, trying to act like Christian people. And so I asked God if he would be willing to remove my shame and guilt, but not the memory of my sin. You, you know this song, um, Amazing Grace? Y'all ever heard that before? It, it's kind of like in the top 10 of Christian world. It'll be on the radio soon. Um, Song that says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, I was blind, but now I see. There's a movement a number of years ago where second base people said, Hey, let's get rid of the word wretch. That sounds so harsh. Let's do something like lamb. Saved a wandering lamb like me. Well, John Newton knew nothing of any movement to try to change that word because John Newton made his living by selling black people to white people for a profit. John Newton was a rapist of that same people. So when John Newton penned the word wretch, he was talking about himself. Respectfully, maybe it'd be good if we remembered there's some wretch in all of us. Am I okay with that? Because when I remember what God did for me and how God altered the trajectory of my life, 
I have no problem joining the mission of Jesus to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus found Zacchaeus in a sycamore tree. He found John Newton on a slave trade ship. And he found Tom Harding in a little church in Blacksburg, Virginia, sitting in a sermon he was bored to death on. And he saved me. Come on. He saved me. And I want to spend the rest of my life, however much breath I have, joining him in that mission. So think about it. If you're standing on second, go after the four Ds. That'd be a great place to plug in. Jesus, thank you for these great folks and uh, their grace in listening today. And um, Lord, I do sense your spirit working in this particular service in a powerful way. I, I believe you're speaking to the hearts of people. I think you're speaking to a lot of base runners. And I hope there'll be some conversation, maybe even as they walk out of this room, instead of heading to the car, maybe they'll courageously say, hey, let's go back and check out what's happening in that room just to see if this is where God wants us. Lord, when I go to sleep at night sometimes, and when we go together in prayer, I think about what it would look like if just the alive community would start running the bases. If people listening to the sound of my voices, if together we would do whatever we could to reach the Zacchaeuses in the world. Lord, that not only create momentum in this church, but I think it'd create a movement in the upstate. Just people willing to get off second base to try to steal third. Lord, I think about the folks who've gone through four Ds. Some have answered calls to ministry. Some have started new ministries. Some have found places to serve quietly. Some have started to give generously because God has blessed them with an ability to make money. And they use those resources to seek and save the lost. And Lord, as long as I pastor this church, may we be known as a church who actively and aggressively seeks and saves lost people. For your name, for your glory, and for your kingdom to advance. Amen.